Yeah. Okay. So this is a, this is a talk I'm kind of also given give an overview of this our in lab project and this is essentially what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of a, a small. It's a it's a big group, but there is a small core team. It's essentially me and Finn that uh, <clears throat> write the code. Okay. So it, it's not, uh, I'm just saying that it's our in-lab project. It's not formally a project. It's more like an umbrella. So more like um, a kind of an, a name for a common research interest that center around this kind of package. And development we do usually kind of turn up in this package in the end. So the, the plan for this talk is kind of just to give an overview, a little bit overview of what it is, and essentially to discuss some recent development, um, a little bit work in progress that we do in this project that you might find useful. So what is it really? Yeah, it's an R package and it does um, approximate patient inference for a class of model that we call latent Gaussian models. And it's an interface in R to define analysis and evaluate such models. And this class of latent Gaussian models, it's, it's a little bit abstract, we, we come to this. And what's the kind of the benefit? The benefit is essentially low computational cost. The accuracy is pretty good, it's high accuracy. We can define very complex model. This is mainly, maybe the most important point that a lot of things that we do in a kind of applied stat is essentially within this class of laden Gaussian models. And we come back to what it is. As very good support for spatial models. And if you're doing kind of applied and advanced statistical work is, I think it's very, very useful, uh, useful tool. And because of scale and kind of uh, robustness in terms of the inference, many of these kind of models that we want to kind of fit is kind of hard to fit with any kind of other kind of standard, kind of more simulation based kind of framework before the arrival of this R in love package. So what is this Gaussian models? This is kind of abstract, I'll just scan through it. We have some observations. Essentially think of a generalization of, uh, of additive models. We have observations that depends on something and it depends on something and that something is Gaussian. Additionally to that, there are some non-Gaussian hyperparameters. They could also be Gaussian, but mostly they are non-Gaussian. So we have some observations, we have some Gaussian part, and we have a prior on something that is not Gaussian. And this is essentially what we call a late Gaussian models. So we see that there is a lot of structure here. You know, we have a big Gaussian part. We have some parameters that are non-Gaussian. They are usually very low in dimension. The Gaussian part is high in dimension, and the likelihood is what it is. And from this is a send the main part is to compute marginal distributions. And we do this using another uh, technique. It's called integrated uh, nested Laplace approximation. So it's like Laplace approximation inside this model. Okay. So what is this? There is a lot of models that is essentially in this kind of class and the more As a dimension grows, you go to space and go to space time, and the more kind of higher dimension model, the more Gaussian they get, essentially because this is what we can do in higher dimensions. Survival, joint, competing is. So it's, I must kind of um, emphasize that this concept of latent Gaussian model it's, is, not as, is not useful as a tool for doing modeling. It's not useful to think in terms of that, but it's extremely useful to have this kind of concept for doing the computations, doing the inference. So we take a model, we put it into that framework, and then we can use that kind of general code. Okay. 
So what is this Laplace approximation? I just want to go through some of these technicalities. So what is it? It's old technique for approximating in integrals. So you have an integral and you have integral of a smooth function and you have a constant that goes to infinity and you want to approximate this kind of integral. So what you do, you do a Taylor expansion and essentially what you get is like a, a quadratic term and what then the integral is essentially the normalizing constant for a normal. So this is essentially uh, what this is. The point is that this kind of approximations has very high accuracy. Here is a relative error is one over n, which is uh, square root of n better than if we're doing kind of Monte Carlo based inference. Okay. So this is kind of, you can see that if we can kind of make use of this, then this could be very, very useful. Here I'll just show an example. And uh, this is a logistic regression example. So like a bivariate normal. And we have two observations, they are both one. And we just want to kind of compute the marginal for one of them. Okay, so essentially we have to approximate this integral. I'll just show you how, how things kind of behave when we're doing this kind of approximation. So what's the computation that we need to do? Um, they are for each, we choose a value of x1 and then we approximate this integral. And then this is how we kind of, we kind of integrate out the other variable. So to do that, we have to compute the mode and the curvature at the mode, and then we use this Laplace approximation to integrate out x2. And you have to do that for every value of x1, okay? So of course you lay out the grid and you do this kind of more in, in an intelligent way. So this is, this is kind of the results you get in the normal case for, um, so this is if we don't, do any integration out. We just do a joint Gaussian approximation. This is what you get if we do the Laplace, then you see we get this kind of correction and we can kind of compute the true value by doing numerical integration. And this is what you get. So you see that it's essentially exact. If we go to a difficult case, things get more extremes. This kind of parameter, we can tune them so they get difficult. So you see that uh, approximation differs a bit from if we only assume that the, the Gaussian. And this is the exact, and you see we do a tiny error, but this is a, a very hard case. If we go to an insane case, so uh, almost at the point where the merits kind of break down, this is what we'll get for the Laplace approximation, and this is the true value. So we see that even in the insane case, this kind of, the results are not too bad. Okay, they capture location quite good. There are some details, but this is an insane. So essentially, this case here is, even this case is kind of very hard to kind of, you see in reality. So we are somewhere between this case um, and this case in, in practice. Okay. The point is that if you want to kind of get the computations kind of smooth, you cannot have just any Gaussians. Okay. So we're working with, we have essentially we had to work with Gauss Markov random fields, so kind of Gaussians and graphs where we have conditional independence and we kind of deal with, this is the important concept and not kind of independence in itself, okay? This simply say that we have a sparse precision matrix because condition, if you have conditional independence is simply uh, relate to a sparse matrix. So it means that we can work with numerical algorithms for sparse matrices and this gain benefit is speed and memory. Okay. So all these tools are available as packets. There are a few books that is written on this. 
there is all the software, all the code that we do in this project is kind of open. It's all there at Bitbucket. And there is extensive use in applied statistics, biology, ecology, whatever, health, etc., about applications of this. I want to I want to go into some of this some of these uh, details and uh, let me go here. So I want to discuss a little bit area models. So models are where you have data on this regions like counts typical in this disease mapping and kind of and similar uh, uh, similar problems and uh, often they are called the high car model of the car model or the high car model it's like an intrinsic model so there is a built-in singularity into to the model and this is the condition expectations it's just the mean of the neighbors and the variance also will scale with number of neighbors and there are usually some kind of zero sum to zero constraints in here i uh, want to kind of discuss the issue about setting priors for this kind of precision so how much how much kind of smoothing you are supposed to do with this kind of model yeah so many Call this iCarmel. I, I don't see any. I never understood why. And uh, so in the package, this is called the model is BZAG. So that's what it's uh, in the in the package. So how how to kind of set the prior for this precision? The the thing is that it seems very easy, but it's kind of a bit intricate. The point is that if if you're doing if you're doing this kind of models more automatic from maps you easily get singletons like you see on the map here you have 92 211 that are no neighbors you might have an island you have a big connected graph this kind of mainland so what to do with this and uh, the how uh, The original formulation never kind of really discussed that and what to do with some to zero constraints in this kind of case and uh, what is the effect of the graph itself if any and um, the thing is that without thinking carefully to these kind of questions and kind of providing a good answer there is no point of even thinking of putting a prior for this kind of precision so a main observation is that these models depends on the graph the properties of these models depends on the graph and not only the dependent properties but which is kind of a feature but also the kind of the the variance properties depend on the graph so you can we can interpret this precision parameter to control the deviation from the null space and the null space here is just a constant that is zero okay the point is that if you take this uh, this example here you look at the geometric mean for the margin variance condition on within this kind of proper subspace that will be about 0.5 where the geometric mean for the small island on the right that shows up it should be on the left Okay. It's about 0.4. Okay, so it's like a 25% difference in the in the margin variance when this kappa is one. And kappa is one should kind of correspond to a margin variance of one. Okay, here is one half and 0.4. So we see that there is a dependence on the graph and there is a dependence between the connected. Uh, components in the graph okay so they are different because the graph is different so it means that if we have an overall same kappa here we'll see that we'll um, smooth the island more than we do on the mainland 
unless we do a correction. And the correction is just 0.5 divided by 0.4. Okay. So essentially, if, if we want to have kind of controllable uh, output from these kind of models, we have to scale them carefully. We have to, we have to know what we're doing. So we can kind of use them kind of automatic. So essentially, we have to scale each connected component to have a unit geometric mean on the variances. This is what we suggest. Of course, if you have singleton, there is no neighbors. And in the original formulations, many use like a, a uniform distribution there. And this is, this is no good at all. So this should be an IRD standard normal when kappa is one. And we need one sum to zero constraint for each kind of subgraph that is larger than one. So in this case here, on the figure on the right, you have one linear constraint on the mainland, one on the island on the right, and the two singleton live their own life. Okay. So if you do it like this, then the precision and the clear interpretation as a margin precision, controlling the deviance from the null space, and we know exactly what we're doing. And we're doing the same amount of smoothness, smoothing for each connected component in the graph. So how to set the prior, we have this concept, what is called penalized complexity prior. I have no time to discuss it, but essentially it do a proper contraction towards a simpler model. And essentially if you, I'm just taking time. Try to go back a slide and it's just spinning. Okay, so these kind of priors do a proper contraction and uh, the simpler model is turned out to be just a constant in this case. So it do, it treats all the kind of parameter smoothing all the parameters as it transfer them into a contraction to a simpler model and use a proper prior for the distance between the models. And this is an extremely useful concept and uh, this is how it's kind of defined. So this is our kind of default way to think about priors if we don't know what we're doing and we normally don't know. Okay, so this is the i car or car model that many calls it, and then we are we are moving towards the BIM model where we add a structure and unstructured term. Okay, in my view, there is a lot of confusion in literature about this thing, and the thing is that in order to deal with this kind of model structure in a good way, we need to kind of control the overall variance and how to distribute the variance between the structured and unstructured part. And so the basic idea is to have, a, have the correct convex combination of two limiting cases, structured and unstructured. Essentially, this means that we need to, we need to work on the covariance scale. The only way to do this properly is to have a convex conversation combination between two covariance matrices and not precision matrices. Convex combination between two precision matrices has no interpretation. And then we have prior, we have these penalized complexity priors to do the proper squinkage. And of course, everything is graph dependent, so we have to do this properly. The thing is that this is, this is, we can do, we have to do this in the covariance scale, but we cannot do the computations there because we need to maintain that this kind of precision matrix, inverse covariance is sparse. Okay, so the, of course, there is a trick. We can use this 
joint distribution of cumulative sums and some hacks to transfer these kind of models into a model for the, the precisions on a larger domain. And we can do then the matrices are all kind of sparse and everything is kind of properly done. And this is the model, what's called BIM2, in this kind of package. And this is kind of the prior for the mixing, how much of the variance that should be contributed, how, how to split the variance between the independent term and, uh, and that term that have dependence, okay? This kind of prior, a proper prior here will depend on the graph itself. So that's why it need to be kind of computed online. It's computed when you kind of call these kind of functions. Okay. So here are some other uh, developments that are more recent. Essentially, it's correcting for skewness. Okay, so we're moving towards approximations that can more properly correct for skewness. There are some tools that we had that are now extended. I want to mention a little bit quantile regression for discrete responses. A little bit into survival, um, more about parallel computing and uh, more continuously indexed Gaussian fields when you have barriers, islands, coastlines, these kind of things. And some recent work on non-separable space-time models that we finally um, is more or less finished with. No, yeah, first version is there, okay. Correcting samples for skewness. Okay, so it, we, have, we had the opportunity for quite some time to kind of, if you do a fit of these models, we could sample from the internal mixture representation and we can do that kind of exact, so we can kind of create samples from the posteriors, approximately the posteriors. The new feature is that we can correct for skewness in these samples. Previously, it's only a uh, sample from the Gaussian part. Now we correct also for skewness in the marginals. You see kind of the difference on the right. It's more accurate and we essentially get back to where the marginals that we should have. We can now do this at almost no zero, almost zero at a cost. And this is, this is not easy because the natural way to do the corrections involve quite a lot of computing. At least when you have to do this like hundred thousands of times, which is often the case when we have to correct all the samples, all the elements in every sample, okay but we are, uh, Christian has been able to uh, nail this down. So this is almost quick. There is also another kind of uh, line of research, which might be quite useful. And uh, this is essentially to compute analytic joint approximations and not only kind of marginals, but you can create a subset of variables and get a joint distribution of those. Okay, you see something on the right, there is some code, you define what's called a selection, which indexes of the latent field you want, and you can kind of compute a joint approximation to that one while doing the rest of the analysis. So you get a new, uh, you get an object or a new class in the joint margin, and you can kind of there are tools for working with it. And this approximation is essentially a skew normal marginals with a Gaussian coupler. And this is what we have found out is uh, it's, a good, it's a good compromise between complexity and accuracy for uh, this kind of approximations. We could also have a mixture of skew normal marginals with Gaussian couplers but we could also just join them all together. There are also tools for operating on this one. You can evaluate this, you can sample this, you can compute marginals of this one again, a linear marginal for linear combination of within this kind of new class. Okay. 
I want to mention another kind of um, some development is quantum regression. Quantum normal regression normally relates the mean to the linear predictor, but uh, quantum regression relates the quantile to uh, the linear predictor. The kind of surprising thing, if you start to look into that, is that this kind of this field of literature is almost almost non-parametric. So it's almost like if we're doing all kind of um, uh, regression using least squares. Here they use not least squares, but they like you have the absolute value of the error, and you make that kind of skewed, and you can kind of um, get the quantile. The important thing is that this is not the likelihood. Okay. This is not the measure. This is not kind of how the data enters the model. This is just a kind of a something that will give you the quantile. Okay. And you might think, okay, this kind of works well if the response, this can work if the response is continuous, if the response is discrete. Like for sort counts, how do we define it then? And the kind of the common approach, you add noise and you pretend, you add noise to the count data and you pretend that uh, the data are continuous. And then you use this kind of non-parametric approach. This is this is no good. We want to do this properly in the kind of patient context, and the, of course, for the discrete responses, the quantile function is a step function. There are continuous versions of uh, Poisson binomial, negative binomial, this kind of thing that have the same interrelationship between them as we would expect in the discrete case. You know, so it's essentially involving ratio of gamma functions, the CDF. So the incomplete one and the, the complete one. And this will give you the kind of the CDF for the Poisson at this kind of integral values. So there, are, there is a relationship with the continuous Poisson and the discrete. But we cannot just use the continuous Poisson instead of the Poisson, that doesn't work. It's like the, the parameters are different and the range are different. It turns out that if you, if you, if you shift the quantile function, it is the same at this integer values. So kind of this justified that um, we can use a shifted quantile function for the continuous version of the Poisson to do a kind of model-based interpolation of the quantile function for the discrete Poisson. Okay. So essentially, if you have Poisson count, you can still do quantile function, quantile regression, you just define this kind of quantile function as a new link function. And this is now fully supported in the, in, in the package. You simply define the link function to be the quantile and you set the quantile. So all these problems with um, quantile crossings, that you normally have, they almost disappear. That you're estimating a quantile that is, it doesn't have the right ordering. As a, like a sequence of quantile, uh, sequence of estimate that doesn't have the same uh, correct ordering if you have different quantiles. So this is much, much less of an issue and is more, um, is more indication of model misfit and not something we want to hide away. So it's more, it's more within this kind of model-based uh, framework like we have here, it's something you want to know if happening and not something you want to hide away, okay? And this all kind of makes sense. Another line of research is um, survival models and we kind of started again when we have a we have a new post we have postdoc here at Kaos, uh, Janet von Gilk. She's working with this. And there is a lot of 
exciting development in that area. So often we have we have measurement over time, and we are also measurement for the kind of uh, survival for each kind of object, but also follow each kind of object over time. And thing is, we want to kind of use all the data, and we can have longitudinal models, and we can all we also have survival models. All this kind of is kind of classical, but the point is that you can often rewrite them into a latent Gaussian models. We know that from the Cox proportional hazard model, we can rewrite them into a Poisson regression on a larger space. Okay, and how are these joint models kind of constructed? They are usually constructed by we sharing some kind of random effect, like the WS is like a random effect connected to a subject, and we kind of this kind of random effect is shared between different parts of the of the models. There are different ways how you can do the sharing, and that gives you different ways to how you construct the dependence between them. Okay. But the point is that we can go through this kind of list and we can work out the mapping from these kind of models into a latent Gaussian models, and then we can use the kind of the software to do these models. There are more also here, like competing risk models, there are some multi-state models, spatial survival and joint models, survival models and joint models with all these kind of splines, all these kind of things, they, they go into the same framework. Okay. So there is a conceptually no when it comes to the computations of this, there are conceptually no, no kind of, no difference between them. It turns out to be a latent Gaussian models and we can use the kind of tools we have to do that, computations. Here is another topic um, that we, at least me, been kind of interested in for some time. is Bayesian analysis with no feedback. Okay, and this this occurs when you know of it. It occurs more often than you think. Okay, so basic probability only say that if the probability for a condition on b depends on b, then b condition on a depends on a. Okay, so you cannot have dependence in only one direction. Dependence in kind of if b depends. If A depends on B, then B depends on A. And this feedback is at the core of the base theorem. And there are questions with, there are problems where we don't want this kind of feedback. And then the question is what to do. I must say that the Winbugs, in the Winbugs project from early 90s, I think uh, they had this, option, I, I'm not sure exactly when it arrived. There is something called a cut operator that works on the graph. So there was having this kind of question, uh, turns out this cut operator is essentially the wrong solution. It's, it's just wrong, but uh, the question is correct. Okay, so here is, um, the only COVID-19 related slide I have. So if you, if you have an imperfect test for a prevalence theta, then you have probability for a positive test. It depends on the sensitivity and the specificity. Okay. Let's say we have from another study, we know the distribution of the sensitivity and specificity. The data we have is like, we have the, the result of this test, and this is not informative about sensitivity and specificity itself. It's like by construction that you cannot tell who is who. And the question is what to do. The point is if we have external knowledge about the distribution for sensitivity and specificity, it's like including them in the model as random variable using this external knowledge and priors. Then it turns out that this sensitivity specificity will easily adapt to the model misspecification that we have in the model. 
So essentially, if, if you know that nothing of the data, nothing of the rest of the model will inform you about sensitivity and specificity, you will expect the posterior distribution to be the same as the prior. It turns out that this is not the case. So the model will kind of use the extra flexibility it has for sensitivity and specificity to account for model misspecification in some way. And this is called the, this is the feedback. We can still account for the distribution for sensitivity and specificity, and we can kind of propagate that uncertainty throughout the analysis by doing the analysis without feedback. So we can take the analysis, conditioning on sensitivity and specificity, and we can integrate out the distribution for sensitivity and specificity. So in this way, you see that the, if you look at the whole expression, you see that the prior for sensitivity and specificity is the same as the posterior in a way. It's not the true posterior, but you got my point. We can do integration in low dimension. In higher dimension, we have to do scenario analysis. So essentially, we have to sample values for sensitivity, specificity, or whatever we have uh, available. And then for each of those, do the analysis and then join everything together. There are tools in ILA to help you merging results, which is essentially uh, very useful in this kind of context. It's called ILA.merge. So you take uh, fitted models with different kind of parameter and merge the results in, uh, in this kind of sense. It can also be used for something else. Here is another kind of context where the same problem appear. So this is, um, you see on the left, we're doing kind of wind speed uh, modeling on the, the country. And this is a highly non-stationary process. So instead of having a non-stationary model, we have just a union about, I think is about 2000 smaller stationary models. And these are indicated by the dots. Of course, if you make the, the region small, you have a high variability in the high parameter. Think about variance and range. If you make the, the region large, this uncertainty go down, but the, then it's harder to capture non-stationarity. Okay, so a feasible thing is to estimate that first round, you estimate all the high parameter and their kind of distribution. And this is what you see on the left and the middle. And then we take those and we can kind of smooth them. We can adjust this hyperparameter. We can adjust the kind of, uh, we can borrow strength and kind of correct the posterior for the hyperparameters. And this is what you get on the left, on the right. The point is that we have to, we have to propagate this kind of uncertainty back into the analysis. So we have to account for the uncertainty in the range and the variance for this corrected estimate and update then the results that we get there. And there we use exactly this kind of no feedback analysis. So this simply allows us to make, to have much smaller region and we can tolerate at the first round much higher uncertainty in the high parameter estimate. Since we correcting them and then propagate that posterior into the analysis correctly. This is uh, very exciting. Here is another thing. Uh, we're also working more towards um, uh, high performance computing. And this is a new collaboration with uh, the Paradiso software or library for sparse matrices. This is like almost essentially the state of the art. Uh, parallel matrix solver. Now we can do models with on a on a larger parallel machine on order of millions. Okay, we can do that with this kind of software, and we need that when we're working towards um, models in space and time. 
Okay, so there will be more to come here. This is like a prototype that we have. Okay. Especially this is useful when we think about Gaussian fields in two dimension, especially pre, like two dimension plus time. And normally a Gaussian process, if you look at the literature, is defined for covariance functions or matrix. And we don't think that's the right tool for the job. So we need to work directly in the sparse for computational reasons. And this means that they are Markov. This correspond to a more kind of physical motivated description or construction of these kind of processes. Okay. And this is like an old, old kind of view. Um, so essentially this go back to the fifties uh, where Peter Will described how to define Gaussian fields through stochastic differential equations. Okay. The point is that working with differential equations is kind of harder to work with, but if you first know how and know how to do that, then everything even the hard problem becomes almost trivial, okay? It turns out that, yeah. I just want to make you aware of some cool tools that we have. So this is like what, to, okay. First you create a tool and then you find a motivation. Huh? Okay, so these are, this is the spatial region. So they are, it's a part of the, the coastline. And you have measurement in the sea, some fish larvae counts. The point is that if you want to have dependence models, you want essentially the dependence model to go around islands. Okay, you, they don't they don't cross the islands. So you want the dependence to go around islands, and you have like a complicated geometry like this. And this is this is a very complex non-stationary model. Okay, because you have to kind of obey the geometry, but at the same time, it's a very, it's a non-stationary model with essentially no parameters. The geometry of the islands is given and you just have to obey them in a way. Okay, so uh, the question is, how do you do that in a consistent way? How do you change uh, uh, like a, a maternal model to account for these islands. And it turns out that the solution is, if you work with these PDEs, the solution is, essentially you can write it down in two lines. You simply define a different range, one on the sea and one on land, and then essentially you get what you need. So essentially what you can do, you can construct this automatically on this kind of islands without, and we have the same computation properties as without any barriers. Okay, so we can deal with these non-stationary models without any additional parameter, same computational cost, and it just do the right thing. So here I'll just show you some, some code just that you can do it. So this is, the, this is the area, you have to define the mesh and Finn created a software to find the mesh. You have to define the model on this kind of mesh and you have to define the model on the mesh and uh, give everything then in and then you have to pass this R object into the formula, okay. And then the R object is passed into the C code and interpreted in the C code by the R engine. Okay. And then everything runs as normal. And then you, this is just a point saying how the, how the kind of dependent goes. You see it follows the kind of the, and the islands and it simply seemed to do the right thing. Last kind of topic is uh, some recent some recent work. This has been going on for ages, and it turned out to be a very hard problem: how to define properly non-separable space-time models based on these PDs. That is a natural generalization of the modern models that we usually work with in space. 
course, uh, we're using the SPDs. Here, there are many details, and they turn out to be much more difficult than we thought. And um, the aim, of course, first you find an overall large class of models that do the right thing, and then inside here you find the a good candidate that is simple and has a physical realistic model. So all these kind of class of models have good properties from a physical point of view as well. And then there is a problem of parameterization. We cannot just have parameters anywhere in these PDs if you don't know what they are. What do they mean? Okay, so these are a new preprint that um, arrived in archive this week. So we have natural range parameter as we have for the spatial models. We have a natural range parameter also for the dependence in time. We can control the margin variance. We can, we have a non-separability parameter. So it goes between zero and one. Zero for separate, a separate model and one if it's like as non-separable as it could be. For the kind of the, what we consider as a good starting point model, we have a finite element representation of this model, which is only slightly more neighbors than a, a standard kind of separable model where we have an autoregressive process of order one in time and a return covariance in, in space. If you do the, the separable version of this, you'll get about 74 neighbors. Here we can do this non-separable version of the same thing uh, for only 84 neighbors. So the cost is essentially the same. This is currently available only for this our generic interface and there is more to come about this. And you can also extend this to do, you can take the same model and apply it on the sphere as well. Okay. Just want to show you the, the kind of fundamental difference between a prediction with a separable model and a non-separable model. So the, the picture on the left is just a realization of a Gaussian field. And then we do a prediction on this using a separable model. So if you follow the, uh, the picture on the left, as we go forward, you see that we have essentially the same structure. It's just kind of fade down. This is essentially because it's separable and it's like every point is just going like exponentially down to the mean. On the right hand side is a non-separable model. So the, of course, starting points is the same. If we then do prediction, you will say that, you see that we immediately do this kind of diffusion. So you, it's more that it, you have some kind, of, it's almost like you have some kind of convolution that would convolve and convolve until essentially go down to the mean. Okay. It's only mean that if you're starting here, then the prediction for a single point can go upwards, can be like higher before it go down to the mean, simply because the neighbors can be higher. Okay, because you have this diffusion. Okay, you see this here in this in the valley in the middle, that the value would rise and then drop again before they drop. Okay, so we think that the, the most difference between the separable and non separable model would be in terms of the prediction. Okay, it doesn't mean that non separable model. Or if it's like separable, it's kind of useless. This is not the case. But the main difference is for doing predictions. Okay, so essentially there is still a lot of development in the project. There are exciting working projects that I haven't told you about. The thing about the priors that I haven't discussed is is very, very useful. Um, it should be much more used instead of just doing random guesses for priors that 
very often do exactly the opposite of what you want them to do. It's a, it's a very, it's a very scary story about how behave on the on a distance scale between distributions. Okay. These laden Gauge models, it's a very useful class of models. And um, there is a, because of all this nice structure, there is also a very, there is a, a lot of nice things that we can do and the computations are quite manageable, often the case. And of course, there are models that is not in this class and this is fine and then we cannot do it. And then you have to do it in some other way. Everything is there on this rinland.org and uh, there is no references to this talk. In this talk, uh, they are everywhere. Okay, so I know that they are missing in this sense. The book on the right is um, it's essentially an, a book that was arrived one and a half year ago, December 2018, is about these SPD models and how to use them with our inline. So it's essentially a big, almost like a big tutorial on how to use this and what problems you can solve and how to use this software and this kind of framework in this model. Okay. So I think that's it.